there's a lot more time to expand on the world and explore different elements in a TV show compared to a film. What was the most exciting thing about this format for Abominable? Um, it's the opportunity to explore different creatures and expand everybody's story, um, flesh them out and see more of their lives. Yeah, it makes sense. And, you know, there's very authentic inclusion and representation found in the series. What does it mean to be telling stories about Chinese culture and having it done by Chinese and Chinese American creatives? I think it's really important. And this is part of the reason why I love working on this show so much is that we get to bring authentic voices into um, the, the series and really showcase the best part of what we love about Chinese culture to worldwide audience. So yeah, I think that's really great. Yeah, I think that shines through really well in the show. Thank uh, you. And so music also plays a key role in the show. How did you decide what sort of songs to include? Um, this is probably a question more for our composer, George, but I'd say, yeah, I, I'm always really impressed of what he can come up with uh, in terms of like capturing the flavor of Chinese culture, but also uh, bring variety of um, musical styles into different scenes. So yeah, um, I, I really like George's music and also Jim, he uh, plays a huge role of like uh, sitting through our music spotting sessions and, you know, like having the ear to say, okay, this part we wanted to uh, feel more emotional or that part we wanted to feel more action and, you know, uh, epic. Um, we really get that across. Awesome. And we saw this with the recent Kung Fu Panda series as well, where Jack Black reprised his role. What did it mean for you to get Chloe Bennett back as Yi? Um, I mean, I just think it's super awesome because she embodies E as a character so well. Her voice um, is this like very unique, kind of uh, uh, very strong, but also has this vulnerability if we needed to. Um, yeah, uh, so she really plays, uh, plays up E's complex character. Awesome. And uh, DreamWorks has been able to navigate this many times, but, uh, and you also worked on Turbo Fast. Uh, but what challenges come with adapting a film into a series? Mm. I think the challenge is probably more like understanding what makes the original film work so well uh, and extract those best part of it, whether it's character personalities, um, it's like the character dynamics between different casts. Um, and then it's just that world where in the original movie, everyone has a uh, sort of like skim to surface introduction of what our world looks like. Uh, but then there's so much potential of what could be more. And so then we just take that opportunity and run with it and say like, you know, uh, you've seen these beautiful sceneries and beautiful like, you know, uh, mountains and, and cities and all that. And then we're gonna give you more and make you, um, just enjoy the process of living in this living, breathing world more. So I think that's, sure. that's like not maybe not so much of a challenge, but more like uh, opportunity, I'd say. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, there's also a great mix of comedy and adventures in the series. What was the key to that balance? Um, I think maybe emotional realism, because we're telling a story based in, you know, a grounded in a city where it's in China and then it's Chinese culture, but at the same time, we're bringing these fantastical creature, legendary creatures and then pretend they're, they're in our lives, they're real. And so we just have to open our mind and imagine that scenario and put our characters in, in that shoes and say, can you imagine when you're living your day-to-day -day life and then you see these magical creature appear in front of you and they're doing these cool, amazing things. How are you going to react? How are you going to feel? And so we just like go from there and then say, how can we capture that magical and emotional realism um, and, you know, portray our characters reacting to those situations and not, not only um, initial shock, but also getting used to them and then eventually having fun with them and then feeling that bond and, you know, feel like your life can't be without them. So it's that transition. Awesome. And uh, you directed several episodes of Little Ellen, which was recently removed from HBO Max. What's your reaction to such a move where art is being stowed away rather than being accessible to everyone? Oh, of course, that's the biggest bummer ever, <laughs> because I feel like animation is just so 
so awesome. Like, can you imagine your world without animation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, kids growing, like millions of kids growing up, they're watching these beautiful, funny, heartwarming shows on TV and they are influenced and they grow up wanting to be a good person because of how these um, animated characters basically like role modeled for them of how they wanted to be. And, you know, someone comes in and take that away from you. That's a huge loss culturally, um, I think. So I really hope that never happens again. Absolutely. And my last question on a, on a higher note is, which legendary creature from the series were you most excited to implement and why? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, they're all so cool. I mean, I just, I can't even, like, they're all my favorite children. Um, but I'd say out of the episodes that I have d directed on, I'd say Todd the Toad is the most funny. And because of he his existence, our characters' lives uh, have been turned upside down and it's like a really really fun episode to watch 